Welcome to another class of Atmel 412. In the previous classes, we introduced a lot of basic concepts to understand how the atmosphere works, and particularly to understand the behavior of the atmosphere at the synoptic scale in the mid-latitudes. We talked about the fundamental equations. We talked about quasi-geostrophic approximation. We talked about the isentropic analysis. And recently, we talked about potential vorticity. After having discussed all these basic frameworks to understand and to diagnose um, what is happening in the atmosphere, uh, we now turn to a bit more of an applied um, view of the phenomena, and we start to talk about cyclones. Now, cyclones, or sometimes we call them extratropical cyclones to distinguish them from other kinds of cyclones, like tropical cyclones or arctic cyclones, Extratropical cyclones are one of the basic, one of the main actors in the mid-latitudes. They were, in a sense, one of the drivers in the development of modern meteorology in the way that we understand it. And they still remain one of the main, uh, one of the main focuses of research uh, in these latitudes. They are very often responsible for pretty substantial severe weather, uh, but they also play an important role in the circulation of the atmosphere, as we'll see in a minute. So um, this picture over here on the slide represents um, a view of an extratropical cyclone from a satellite. We're more or less attuned and sort of more or less used to seeing what these extratropical cyclones look like. Uh, but this is really just to sort of refresh our, uh, our memory as to what they look like. So typically when we look at them from the satellite, they present themselves with that sort of comma-shaped cloud over here <coughs> and with a clean or fairly clear skies um, um, in the back. Now... This, as we will see, this asymmetric structure is one of the basic and one of the fundamental components of extratropical cyclones. And um, something that really drives them apart from, uh, from tropical cyclones, which tend to be a lot more symmetric in their, um, in their appearance. Uh, another thing that I wanted to point out, looking at this figure, is that Extratropical cyclones are typically a lot bigger than tropical cyclones. So we don't have a tropical cyclone here for reference, but tropical cyclones are, let's say, of the order of a few hundred miles. This extratropical cyclone over here extends over thousands of miles, okay? I don't know, 1,000 miles or something like that. <clears throat> so the size difference is also something else that we need to take into account. Extratropical cyclones can often cover um, the entire met latitudinal band, okay? And now we, what we've learned, we can begin to understand extratropical cyclones a little bit. Um, and this is what we'll do in the next couple of lectures. For this lecture, I would like to mainly focus on um, the history. We'll talk a little bit about the history of the study of cyclones. And then we will um, discuss some basic features of cyclones and the climatology of cyclones. And in the next lecture, uh, which will come in a separate video, we will discuss the processes that lead to the formation of cyclones. These are sometimes known as cyclogenesis. <coughs> okay, so let's talk about history a little bit. And before we talk about history, maybe a disclaimer that the way that we discuss history and the way that most textbooks on meteorology that I've seen, uh, at least, discuss history is really from a um, sort of Western perspective in a way. Um, obviously, we as scientists are interested in how a concept developed within what we consider as science and this tends to be fairly modern history, you know, from Galileo onwards, so, I don't know, 16th, um, 17th century onwards. 
Um, but when we talk about the history of some of these concepts in earlier times, uh, we're often biased in a way towards the history of um, these concepts in European um, in European countries. And so when you read about the history of meteorology, um, often people will start from Aristotle. And Aristotle was um, arguably one of the greatest people who ever lived um, in the history of civilization, as far as we know. Um, but Aristotle is credited with having synthesized the understanding of the time and, of course, having also contributed with a lot of his you know, deep insights. Um, but this doesn't mean, obviously, that other cultures were completely oblivious to um, the understanding of the weather. If you think about it, any community that at any given point in time was isolated or dependent on natural resources, and this means every single community that I can think of in the history of mankind, because of, you know, because their survival depended on natural resources, they had to develop some kind of understanding of the behavior of these natural resources. And so this means that virtually every community that we know of has developed some kind of understanding of the weather. Uh, we think about Aristotle as a starting point, but you know this is more or less arbitrary and is certainly comes with all the, with all the biases that, um, that we have when we think about um, Western culture and, and the place of Western culture in the history of, um, of ideas. Um, we don't want to go through the history of meteorology here, so this is just a disclaimer that when we say, oh, the study of meteorology started with Aristotle, well, yes and no. In a sense, it did. In a sense, it didn't. And in a sense, it started tens of thousands of years ago when people started um, living as you know as what we would consider humans, and and you know, and not like um, primates anymore. So you know, just let's just keep an open mind when we talk about the history of meteorology. This is what I meant to say. After Aristotle, for all kinds of reasons that again we will not go into. Um, Western countries, European countries, didn't really progress much, and the Middle Ages were are typically considered a stagnant period, although uh, there's actually a really interesting the history of meteorology and how meteorology evolved through the Middle Ages um, is also very interesting, and the most of the contributions were given by non-European scientists and um, again we will not have time unfortunately to go to go through this but let's just say for simplicity that um, Europeans didn't really progress much in their understanding of the weather and it wasn't until much later um, that some progress was make was made and the progress in terms of um, in terms of um, what I'm calling progress here is the entrainment of ideas of meteorology into the development of physics and mathematics that um, were invented at some point in 15th and 16th century um, in Europe. And um, some of the early contributions include uh, contributions by Euler, which is portrayed here. Euler, I'm sure you know it, uh, was you know, it's arguably one of the greatest mathematicians of, I don't know, the last 500 years, I guess. And so there are a lot of things that Euler did and a lot of things that we can credit Euler for. And um, Euler started thinking about the equations that could be used to describe gases and, and to describe the behavior of, uh, of, um, of the atmosphere. Um, some of the uh, Euler uh, came a bit later, and we're thinking about 18th century with Euler, but some of the equally important contributions came also a bit earlier uh, with people like Newton, um, 
credited with you know, the invention of mechanics, the way that we understand it today, but also people like Halley, Haley, excuse me. Um, and Haley made probably the first scientific predictions uh, that we know of. Uh, and the prediction was the prediction of the arrival of a comet that now bears his name. And this happened sometimes in the 1600s. Um, I forgot exactly the date. And one of the other people who really thought really hard about the behavior of the winds and the atmosphere was Hadley, which you know now we have an entire circulation named after him. Um, Hadley thought about the circulation of the atmosphere because he was interested in the problem of why there are trade winds in you know or the ocean. Trade winds had been used in you know in what would have been considered recent times uh, by navigators, right? Uh, trade winds were used, for better or worse, by a lot of European navigators, so Columbus and, and, and others, and they were used as a way to travel around the world and particularly go to, um, uh, go to America or you know, go to other countries um, in, in Asia. But there still was the question from a scientific point of view of why are there uh, trade winds and Hadley was one of the first people who proposed a model <clears throat> that we call now Hadley circulation and his model was kind of wrong but but not that wrong and it was actually pretty remarkable that in spite of not having a lot of tools uh, some of these people like like Hadley um, <clears throat> like Euler some of these people were able to make significant contributions in our understanding of um, of the atmosphere. Uh, as I said, Euler was the first one to um, write some PDEs for the behavior of the atmosphere. We kind of take it for granted today that we can write PDEs for the atmosphere and that we know what those PDEs look like, but at the time it wasn't so trivial, and it wasn't so trivial to think about what PDEs could have been, um, could have been used for that. A lot of the progress you know, was, it was remarkable, but it was still pretty limited. And um, not a lot of progress was made until, um, well, actually, I wanted to mention this. Uh, some progress was mentioned, was, um, uh, was made by this uh, fellow named um, James Espy. And um, there's a lot of reasons why James Espy is, in, is important. Um, James Espy was the first one to uh, derive um, the uh, dry and the moist adiabatic lapse rates. And he had some hypotheses on, on why the latent heat of condensation played an important role in, develop in the development of cyclones. Uh, but the reason why I'm bringing up Espy is that uh, he um, wrote some of these um, some of his ideas in a paper, in a book, excuse me, there were no I don't think that there were papers at the time, but in a book uh, that came out in, that he published in 1841, and the book had this amazing title, Philosophy of Storms, which somehow, um, I don't know, I find really amazing. It's a beautiful title, so that's why I wanted to mention SP. Um, but anyway, uh, fast forward a couple hundred years, it wasn't really until the 1900s, that people started thinking a little bit more and a little bit more deeply about fluid dynamics. And you have to think about the history of science um, in Europe and in the 1700s very little was known about gases still. And a lot of the progress in the study of gases uh, really happened in the 1800s. And the 1800s were, you know, um, springtime for thermodynamics, right? Uh, we had great people like Avogadro, like uh, Guy Lussac, and it wasn't until much later that people started thinking about how thermodynamics and fluid dynamics could come together and think about, and, and tell us something about the behavior of the atmosphere. People were, in, people were aware of the fact that thermodynamics might have played a role, but in the development of of these weather systems, but just how these two things would come together was not uh, was not entirely trivial. 
And the end of the 1800s are also sort of a period of crisis for, um, for thermodynamics because people start to heat up gases and they discover that gases behave in a strange way <clears throat> and have very weird spectra. Uh, this would later lead to the development of atomic theories and quantum mechanics, which we'll not get into. Uh, but what we will um, discuss now is the contributions of uh, this uh, gentleman from Scandinavian country called Willem Bjerknes. And Bjerknes was um, the son of, a, of another scientist, uh, of another physicist and mathematician. And uh, the Bjerknes lived in Norway, okay, so they come from Norway. And uh, Carl Bjerknes, the father of Willem, um, he studied hydrodynamics. And, um, and in many ways, his son sort of took over, right, when, when his father uh, passed away. And Willem Bjerknes was truly the first one in modern times to realize that we could think about all these theories, uh, thermodynamics, hydrodynamics, we could think about all of these, and we could put them together to predict the weather. We could solve these differential equations using some kind of numerical methods. Um, the year is beginning of the 1900s, so 1904 is um, one year that is often used as, as, uh, as a year in which Bjerknes really conceptualize the development of numerical weather predictions um, through a paper. And in that paper, Bjerknes included a closed set of governing equations for the atmosphere, and he gave an outline on, on how these equations might be used. As we saw, Euler had some PDEs early on, but those PDEs were not a closed system, and they included some things that Euler didn't really know how to treat. Bjerknes is the first one who puts these equations together and says, you know what, maybe if we solve these equations, we can go somewhere uh, with this theory. And once again, it's easy today to overlook the importance of this contribution because we know, uh, you know, now we take it for granted. Now we have weather predictions on our phones, and we sort of take it for granted that these things exist and these things are possible. But, you know, Back in the days, this wasn't so trivial. And to his credit, most people were skeptical um, of Bjerknes' ideas. And so, you know, kudos to him for, um, for insisting that this was really something that could be done. And that provided that there is, you know, he understood that if there was a sufficiently detailed and sufficiently complete system of ob observations, and we had some technique to integrate the equations of motions and to do it fast and effectively, then we could really make these predictions for, uh, for the weather. And Bjerknes put a lot of efforts into developing this program for uh, numerical weather predictions. Um, he traveled everywhere in Norway, met with politicians, he even came to the United States and got some support um, from the Carnegie Institute to start um, this process, and particularly to hire people who would help him do this. And some of these people have names that, you know, we all remember and we all know. So some people, these people include Tor Bergeron, uh, Rossby, who you might have heard, Palmen, who you might also have heard, uh, and Sverdrup. Just to, make, just to name some of them. And these are people who were fundamental in the development of this, um, of this program. Now, unfortunately, one of the key um, uh, moments of these times, and one of the most important processes of this time was, uh, the, um, was World War I. And the war didn't really affect um, Bjerknes personally and didn't really affect Norway. I believe Norway was, if I remember correctly, Norway was neutral during World War I. Um, but 
Some of his collaborators were called to fight the war, and it was really hard to get resources. Um, and when the war broke out, Bjorknes uh, was in Germany, and Germany was directly involved in the war, uh, as you might remember. And so, <clears throat> in many ways, uh, the, war, the war was uh, really an impediment um, in the development of this, uh, of this program. Um, some of the students of Bjerknes, uh, like Herbert, Herbert Petzold, uh, were killed, for example, during the war. Um, and um, in a sense, um, I think people, um, and this, uh, excuse me, and this um, pushed Bjerknes to leave Germany and to move to, um, and to, move to Sweden. Where he developed, um, where he developed a school of uh, meteorology called the um, the Bergen School, uh, which is sort of famous, which has become famous uh, in. Um, sorry, Bergen is in Norway, not in Sweden. I always mix them up. I'm sorry. Europe is very small, and there's a million countries, and it's easy to confuse one for the other. Even though I'm a European, I always confuse some European countries. So, you know, um, it happens. I'm sorry. So uh, Bjarkin has moved back to Norway, and he established a school of meteorology that still remains today as, um, you know, as a famous school uh, that we often talk about. And um, the school had all these great minds, and people started realizing that during the war, people started realizing the importance of having weather forecasts, that weather forecasts were not just, um, were not just useful for you know, fishermen and to know, I don't know, what the season was going to look like. But because aviation was developed at the time, um, having accurate forecasts that and in three dimensions, so you know, of the entire atmosphere, were also useful and could make the difference for you know some of the air battles or you know some of the things that happened in the war. And so, in many ways, the war was detrimental to scientific progress, as it often is. Uh, but in many ways, war was, in some weird way, um, I don't want to say beneficial, but it opened people's eyes to the importance of having accurate and reliable weather forecast. And I must say, for better, better or worse, this is also, you know, something that is common of, uh, of wars, that sometimes they can, um, they can facilitate scientific progress because, you know, just out of necessity. One of the legacy of the war um, in meteorology was that at the time Bjerknes started studying cyclones and started focusing on cyclones. And there were some studies of cyclones that had been done um, and people had noticed that there was a familiar pattern whenever cyclones happened. There was some kind of a pattern in the behavior of pressure in various fields uh, various uh, thermodynamic fields, and <clears throat> Bjarknes developed a theory um, that was called the polar front theory, uh, and he wanted to describe the progression of this front, of this mass of cold air that was advancing, and the war, the excuse me, the word front was actually taken from the terminology of the time, uh, because during the war there were various fronts over which the the war was uh, was fought. And so one of the legacies of the war, bizarrely, in even in common parlance when we talk about meteorological terms, is in the use of this front um, when we talk about the arrival of cold air mass, for example, or, or a warm, uh, warm air mass. And these are characterized by some kind of a discontinuity in temperature because there's this, you know, this cold air that is coming down and this creates almost like a discontinuity and we call this the front. And we'll talk more about fronts um, 
but I just wanted to make this terminological point, which I think is always interesting. It's always interesting to look at the history of words and see what uh, what they tell us. Um, and we don't need to get into the cyclone theory, the excuse me, the polar front theory uh, of Bergen. Um, but his idea was essentially that there was some kind of a polar front along which frontal waves turn into, you know, these cyclones um, that were observed in northern Europe at the time. Um, <clears throat> this didn't turn out to be um, 100% correct, let's say, but it contains some interesting ideas that then led to the development of a better uh, theory for the development of, um, of cyclones. And um, these um, um, these ideas and the idea of Bjerknes were, you know, they received mixed reactions. And some people took them really seriously, and some people uh, dismissed them. Uh, some people criticized them, criticized that, uh, for example, the fact that uh, Bjerknes didn't really do anything other than reorganize what was already known. Uh, and some people were not completely on board with the idea of the polar front and emphasize other processes that might be interesting, might be important in the development of, um, of these cyclones. One thing I wanted to mention is that at this point, um, some people eventually uh, make um, a lot of progress towards the development of numerical weather predictions. And uh, one of these folks is um, Richardson, uh, who in 1992, he undertakes, uh, he does a lot of research. And in particular, he's able to make some accurate predict, excuse me, accurate is not the word, <laughs> to make some precise prediction um, that turn out not to be accurate at all. Um, but he made some prediction about a changing pressure at a particular point. Um, and he computed that using some initial data that was measured and some differential equations that he wrote. And the prediction was not correct. Prediction was actually off by a substantial amount. Um, but with hindsight, the data was really noisy and um, was not, you know, it wasn't the highest quality of data. And the techniques that he used to integrate the equations of motions were slightly rough. Uh, and so in retrospect, uh, maybe such a negative result was to be expected. But it's important that, um, that this sort of planted the seeds for even more of the seeds for, for numerical weather, weather predictions. And um, following this development in 1922, it was Rossby who you know, sort of took on this program. And Rossby was one of the students of the school. Uh, and he moved to the US. And in particular, he went to MIT. And at MIT, he established the meteorology program, uh, which still exists, even though the department changed name. Um, and at MIT, he started developing um, he started developing even more the idea of uh, numerical weather predictions. Um, <clears throat> as I said, uh, Richardson was the person who really made a significant contribution in the development of numerical weather predictions. Bjarkinus didn't really do it. Um, and he did some, um, sometimes we would call it reforecast or hindcast, where he'd try to reproduce um, we try to reproduce the behavior of the atmosphere, but that didn't really work. And this idea was later picked up by Jules Charney, uh, who was a meteorologist at MIT. And Charney um, had this uh, idea of taking, uh, of developing essentially uh, a way to integrate uh, numerical equations uh, using calculators, which had been invented, um, which had been invented uh, in the in the 40s uh, during the war, and so 
The idea of numerical weather predictions started off with a Bergen school and it was brought forward by this Richardson person in the 20s, uh, but it wasn't until much later in the 40s that really this received a significant impetus. Um, and, you know, the credit is to Charney and his collaborators, um, most notably John von Neumann at MIT, at, uh, excuse me, at Princeton. Ch Charney was at, at MIT. Um, and they made the first successful weather prediction uh, using calculators. And um, Charney was um, also kind of instrumental in the development of, um, of modern meteorology. We'll talk about um, baroclinic instability and the growth of disturbances in the atmosphere. Um, Charney was, you know, one of the people who developed the mathematical framework to understand uh, the growth of baroclinic instabilities um, in the 40s. And this showed that it wasn't really necessary to have a strong frontal discontinuity like the polar front theory uh, of, uh, of Bjarkness. And Charney is this you know, central figure in the development of modern meteorology. And also together with Rossby in the development of meteorology in the United States. Um, Charney produced this, these numerical weather prediction that I said, uh, but Rossby also carrying forward the, um, what can we call it, the excitement and the program that was established by Bjerknes, uh, who was his mentor uh, when he was in, in Bergen, um, Rossby really led to the uh, development of weather predictions in the United States. And I forgot if he was the person who developed or convinced politicians to develop the National Weather Service, but he was certainly instrumental in, um, in this development. Now, <clears throat> um, Charney was, uh, Charney died very young and um, one of his mentees and maybe his most notable mentee is Kerry Manuel, who's now still a professor at MIT and very much active and great, great meteorologist. Um, but Charney was really sort of instrumental in the development of, of modern meteorology um, in, the way that, in the way that we understand it uh, today. Obviously, meteorology in 2024 is very different from what Charney knew because, you know, Charney had to develop simplified systems of differential equations to feed to a computer. And computers at the time had very limited power and they were, you know, they would take up entire rooms, right? Uh, I'm sure you've all seen pictures of what computers used to look like back in the days. And um, so you had to be sort of smart to try and, to try and get those to work. Um, Nowadays, we have parallel computers that can run and that can integrate the equations of motion of the atmosphere, and they can ingest and assimilate extremely detailed observations of the atmosphere that come from radio sounds, in situ observations, surface observations, remote sensing observations. And so <clears throat> the field has grown substantially over the last um, six or seven decades. Um, and, you know, and nowadays, numer numerical weather forecasts is something we take for granted and that we even have on our, you know, personal devices that we, that we carry around. Um, I wanted to give this history, to, to tell this history, because sometimes it's important to know, maybe not important, but sometimes it's interesting to know how ideas come about. Um, you know, what is the historical baggage that ideas carry with them? and why we think about certain things the way that we think about them. You know, why do we call them fronts instead of something else? Uh, why did, you know, why did it take such a long time to develop certain theories and to develop um, numerical weather predictions? Um, so history, knowing the history of science is not a necessary condition to practicing science, but it's often useful to understanding the context in which science has been developed and in which modern ideas that we use today
um, have been um, have been developed. So this is really not you know it's not a way to um, idolize these people like Charney or Bjarknes, but it's a way to provide you with a framework to understand how we got to where we are today, um, which sometimes the history of science can be very messy and sometimes knowing the history of science can be important in, in better understanding the problems that exist and better understanding why we are where we are. Okay, so enough about history. Um, let's go back to the cyclones now and let's try to see what cyclones are and how they, you know, how they develop and how we can understand them a little bit better. Um, as I said, we will talk about the climatology and some of the basics of cyclones for the next few minutes, and then we will leave the uh, discussion on cyclogenesis, which in many ways it's, you know, sort of the, um, the more interesting <laughs> in certain ways. Although history is interesting, too. Come on, let's be honest. Um, it's, um, it's more interesting for the purpose of understanding cyclones themselves and not just the history, the, the discipline. Uh, we will leave that discussion for, um, for next time. So in order to understand cyclone and where, why there are cyclones, we must understand why we must understand energy and how energy is distributed um, on, um, on Earth. And what I'm showing here are two figures. Uh, the one at the bottom over here, this is the average incoming solar energy, so how much energy comes from the sun as a function of latitude, so we can think of this as a zonal average. And over here we have, <coughs> uh, we have uh, two curves. The blue curve is the energy that is emitted from the Earth, and the green curve over here is the net radiant, um, the net radiant heating. And the shading over here are a difference between the emission and the absorption. What this graph over here tells us is that in um, met latitudes and polar regions, the Earth is emitting more energy than is absorbing, and vice versa in the tropical bands. Okay, so <clears throat> this suggests that there has to be some kind of transfer of energy uh, from the tropics to the poles, and most of the energy on Earth comes in the tropics because this is where. Um, the sun is at its um, zenith, and so sun rays come with a really perpendicular angle, so they deliver most of the energy uh, to, these, to these regions. When you go, when you move to polar regions, uh, much fewer, much less energy is, is delivered. If the planet had Hadley cells that went from the equator all the way to the poles, the way that Hadley envisioned them, then maybe you could say that the Hadley cell is the primary responsible for this redistribution of, um, of the energy. And it is true that the energy is transferred mostly by the atmosphere, okay? So this is showing annually and zonally averaged northward heat transport Units or measurements are petawatts, um, and this is to balance the net, the net radiative imbalance. Uh, the black line is the total, the red line is the contribution from the atmosphere, and the blue line is the contribution from the oceans. Contribution from the oceans is not negligible, obviously, but the contribution of the atmosphere is obviously dominant. Okay, and this contribution includes sensible and latent heating fluxes. So. Adley cell stops around here, so it doesn't really do much, uh, but the atmosphere is the one, the player that is carrying most of this uh, energy. So what is it? Well, as it turns out, um, there are these objects that are the extratropical cyclones, and these extratropical cyclones are crucial in mixing the tropical air with the polar air masses, 
And so in many ways, you could think of these extratropical cyclones as these giant spoons that steer up the atmospheric circulation. And these help in reducing the pole to equator temperature gradient, and they help in redistributing the energy um, on, uh, on Earth. Now, <clears throat> um, excuse me, I skipped one. Obviously, when we talk about pole to temperature gradient, we must, you know, we must talk about climate change. And we must talk about climate change because climate change is threatening the pole to, to uh, equator temperature gradient. Um, I'm sure you all, you've all heard of the term Arctic amplification. And Arctic amplification means that the Arctic regions are warming at a much faster rate than other regions such as mid-latitude and tropical regions. And so this suggests that there will probably be some large-scale consequences of this. And because the cyclones are involved in steering these two air masses and mixing these two air masses, probably tropi extratropical cyclones will be involved, will be affected by this. Another thing to keep in mind is that a warmer world can contain more water vapor dissolved uh, into the atmosphere. So water vapor is one of the fuels in the latent heat that is released in these <clears throat> extratropical cyclones play a very important role in the development of, um, of cyclones. And this means that things like frequency, intensity, and locations of these cyclones could very well be, uh, could very well be affected. Um, also, the fact that we're changing the dynamical structure of the atmosphere um, will probably also um, affect the distribution of PV anomalies, and so this will also affect the, the distribution of storms. So this is still very much an open question, and I don't want to, you know, I don't have definitive answers, but it is one of the open questions of our time to try and understand how cyclones are going to behave in the future with, um, with a change uh, with a changed climate. So cyclones are organized, um, are pretty well organized, especially in the northern hemisphere. And cyclones tend to happen in known regions that we call storm tracks. And these storm tracks can be visualized in many ways. Uh, one way in which we can see them pretty easily is if we take <clears throat> geopotential height, we compute its variance at a given height, um, and we look at it. Uh, this plot over here shows the northern hemisphere, and this is variance um, of 500 hectopascals geopotential height. The uh, contour interval is 20 meters, and shades are for contours greater than 100 meters. And notice that the highest values of the variance are concentrated in two regions. One begins roughly in Japan, more or less, and extends almost all the way to uh, the shores of uh, North America. And the other starts more or less from the east coast uh, of North America and Canada, so US and Canada, and extend all the way to Europe. In the Southern Hemisphere, the distinction is not so clear because the southern hemisphere if you have noticed there's a lot of ocean in the southern hemisphere and continents don't really mess up with uh, these distributions as much as they do in um, in the northern hemisphere another way to plot these storm tracks is to look at things like meridional wind or vertical velocity field geopotential height is just simple um, to um, to plot and <clears throat> these these tracks are really act as tracks in the sense that they are the regions in which um, in which um, the instability grows, develops, and grows. We call this baroclinic instability, 
and we'll talk about this at a, in a later lecture, these instabilities are the kind of instabilities that lead to the growth of uh, random perturbances um, in the atmosphere. And these are mostly concentrated in these two uh, regions, okay? This is where the, they're, most, um, they're most prominent. And <clears throat> this is where you're going to find them. So the storms develop because there is this you know, sort of baroclinic instability. And when they develop, these extratropical cyclones convert potential to kinetic energy and reduce the baroclinicity in their surrounding, in the surrounding in which they develop. And so I guess one of the questions that comes naturally now is why, if this is so, if cyclones develop because they want to reduce the, this baroclinicity, why is it that we have a continuous generation, continual generation of these, um, of these cyclones? So what is replenishing the instability in a sense, right? It's as if you had like one thunderstorm after the other. If the thunderstorm arises from an instability and the point of the thunderstorm is to reduce this instability, why do we keep observing this thunderstorm, right? And there are many ways, many um, ideas that are being proposed. And so um, some people pointed out that um, the diabetic heating that comes from the, um, um, the um, diabetic processes um, in storm tracks can serve to replenish the baroclinic energy in the storm tracks. So imagine you have this cold continent or air that is spilling over warm waters, right? So the Gulf Stream or the Kuroshio current, this leads to a rapid diabetic warming of the troposphere and, and also the latent heating uh, that is released by condensation within these cyclones is also, um, in so, is also important. Um, it is also important to notice that there are some sort of a uh, influences that can be exerted on the storm tracks, for example, by orography, and we'll talk about uh, Lee cyclogenesis. Uh, but mountains can also lead to the formation of uh, of extratropical cyclones. Uh, but also, the baroclinic energy at the upstream end of the storm track can also lead to st uh, strong disturbances or energy from, you know, like you have essentially the energy from these Rossby waves propagates downstream, um, and it propagates downstream thanks to agiostrophic geopotential flux, and this leads to the generation of, uh, of new cyclones. And I wanted to conclude uh, just talking about uh, the climatology of cyclones in North America. And here we have two different columns here. We're talking about events. Um, this is based on a 20 year, 28 year, 20, excuse me, 28 year sample. And the uh, left columns show aerial frequency of events. Top is in January, the bottom is in July. And the, um, the right column talk about the genesis of these cyclones, okay? Um, so the left one is where they happen, and the right column is where they started from. And this is perhaps not surprising to many of you. There's a lot of influence here on the East Coast. A lot of these cyclones happen towards the eastern part of the continent over here. It's a non-insignificant fraction also over here in sort of South Alaska, um, sort of um, Pacific Northwest and Canada over here, but a lot of contributions over here, and this is the beginning of the storm track, and so you'd expect a lot of them here. And if we look at the genesis where a lot of them are formed, again, not too surprising that you have genesis over here. Again, this is the beginning of the storm track, but notice these points over here just to the east of the Rocky Mountains. And uh, we will talk about um, we will talk about, as I said, Lee cyclogenesis as a way uh, 
uh, to create cyclones, which then propagate over the um, over the United States. Um, and also notice that there is a difference in intensity where you have you know, slightly more extratropical cyclones during the winter than um, during January, excuse me, than, um, than during the summer. And this is likely related to stronger bar baroclinicity in January than, um, than in July. You can also do something similar for anticyclones, for example. Why just focus on cyclones? And anticyclones are less likely to produce high impact weather, but that's still kind of important in trying to understand uh, what happens. And these anticyclones, same subdivision here, left and column, left columns are the events, so where we find these anticyclones. And the right column is where these anticyclones are, where they start from. The top row is January, the bottom row is in July. And <clears throat> it's interesting to see the um, influence of the Great Lakes, for example, between uh, June and um, uh, and July, and uh, excuse me, between January and July. You know, in January, the lakes are kind of warm, and whenever the Arctic anticyclone pass over these lakes, there's strong diabatic heating. This leads to surface pressure falls. And so we have a minimum in anticyclone frequency uh, during January. And the you know, situation is very different in, in July. Uh, but otherwise, anticyclones form over here and over here in, in July. And again, they sort of affect the East Coast. Although notice that in January, they also affect uh, sort of the Southwest regions of the United States. OK, well. Much as we like anticyclones, we will continue our discussion with um, extratropical cyclones uh, next time. And next time, we will start to talk about cyclogenesis. So why do cyclones happen? And how can we understand the formation of, anti of these cyclones from a mathematical point of view using the equations, using the diagnostic frameworks that we introduced in previous lectures. Thank you very much.